the Java code actually compiles down into Scala before it goes down into the machine code. Um, we set up, we altered the architecture a little bit, which I'll get into after this for end tier. Um, and I'll, I'll explain what that is right after the slide. And one of the unique problems that we had was low bandwidth, because a lot of the other groups that went, because there's a couple other groups that go on to Haiti and use this, and they bring their own router, and they'll, they'll put it up in their room, and it doesn't necessarily get the best coverage. They get coverage, but they don't always have the best connection. And so here we're used to, you know, a 60 megabit per second down speed, and that's no problem. Like, I'll take a picture and submit it to Dropbox or whatever, Instagram nowadays. And uh, we ran into this issue where people were taking pictures of the patients, and it was going really slowly. So you know, we, we, we do things like cropping the picture on the client's device before it gets sent over the network. Um, and it's little things like that that make a difference in, in this unique kind of problem domain. And you guys can feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Um, this is our architecture. And when I say N tier, it's because we consider this a five tiered architecture. Um, the important thing to note here are the different layers in the software. It goes from the data layer to the business layer to the user interface layer. And each layer only knows about the one in front of it. Um, play framework by default out of the box comes with three tiers, which is the um, the model, the view, and the controller. And then we add these two on top of it for scalability purposes, which I'll explain kind of why after that, after the next couple slides. Um, so I'm going to go through from the bottom up, kind of explain what it is that we do here to make it scalable. The first layer, the very bottom layer, is the data layer, and that's what connects to the database, right? So we have a repository in the software where so our database, I think, has about 28 tables right now. And so we make about 28 objects that reflect those tables. And what you can do with this repository is instead of writing SQL code in your, in your program, which is a pain, um, you can just call actions on these objects. So say, for example, a patient from the patient table. And you can say, all right, we need to create a patient. We need to update this patient. And it automatically knows because it's mapped to the database. And then these data models, being the, the patients, the patient encounters, photos, they all get sent up to the business layer. And the business layer says, hey, we have patient objects and we have photo objects. But the user interface, when they want, when it gets a patient, it just wants, it wants their photo with the patient, right? But it's separate in the database. So this layer does things like it'll take a patient and a photo object, it'll combine the two and send it up in a user interface model. That's one example. Um, and the reason why that's good is because if you make a change in the database layer, Changes don't cascade up to the user interface, right? They get cut off right here. So the user interface models get sent up to the user interface. And this controller is what takes in the HTTP requests, gets and posts, and all that good stuff. And then it determines what to do with those. So say you get a get request for triage. The controller says, hey, I need to render the triage page. It contacts the business layer, and the business layer sends it, what's it what it needs for the triage page. It populates this view model, puts it into this view template. You can actually write Scala code to help you generate HTML in here. And then it renders it for the user. Um, and the reason that this is so scalable and it's so like abstracted into oblivion, um, there is a reason for it. So in the future, when you have like five million patients. Um, I think right now we've got just over 2,000 from Haiti. Um, so we're on our way, but once you get to that point, a certain database might not work well for you. You might want to switch out the database. And so what you can do with this kind of architecture is you can actually just completely remove the database and put in a separate one. And nothing changes. You don't have to change anything up here. All you have to do is change a little bit right here, and the whole program changes. It's awesome. You can do the same thing with any of the layers. You can take out the entire user interface layer. You can say somebody doesn't like the way it looks, so they want it set up their system a little bit differently. You still have the same concepts, like you're still getting patients. You just might want to display it a little bit differently. You can just completely switch out the user interface layer without changing anything else. And then, then you're just happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's that easy. Right? <laughs> but that's the general idea. So um, using 
Pardon me for jumping. Yep. Are you using like standards for the, you know, you're using a standard um, definition for how these things communicate with each other? Or? Yeah. So everything's interfaced, meaning um, the data models that this, the service layer knows about, um, it's a list of interfaces. And then the implementation of those interfaces is defined here. So that creates a contract between the layers. The interface never changes. Because no matter what, how the patient's implemented, whether you implement the patient data with a MySQL database, a PostgreSQL database, or Microsoft's a SQL Server database, you've always got to get and set an ID for a patient. You've always got to get their first name and set their last name. How you do that doesn't matter. But that contract's defined right here. And the same thing with the UI models. I think hopefully that answers your question. It was a different answer than what I expected, but yeah, yeah okay. So okay. I was thinking about uh, you have like SQL version such and such. Yeah. Thing. And you're, you're stick, sticking to that particular version and so, yeah. Um, so the idea is that you can switch that out, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. all right. Um, the server runs Linux. This dog, Yay. I was sitting up on the second floor and there's just dogs everywhere. And they just come up there and they want food and stuff. So he was kind of my buddy for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and Linux is good because it's highly customizable. And these doctors that go down there, they they don't want to sit on a command prompt, right? They have no idea what to do. So we, we I found this file, I think it was in Etsy, um, RC, I think it was rc.local. But it, when, when, the, when Linux starts up, it executes a script in there. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I start up Netty, and then I start up the application. And then all the doctor has to do is start up the laptop and then close it. Um, and right now, it's kind of funny because we don't we don't have a DNS server set up. Partially my laziness, partially just not having time to do it yet. So all the users actually connect through like 192.168.0.100. It's just some magic number to them that like pulls up an EMR. <laughs> um, and we use Git. And one of the things I thought was funny is if you look at the man pages on Linux for Git, they call it the stupid content tracker. Like, that's Linus for you, but... It's like one of the best ever. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the reason that it's called that, which I thought was kind of funny, is because when Linus started doing Linux, he didn't use version control. He did everything in tarballs, right? Yeah. So everyone would send them a tarball of, of their code, and he would sit there and diff it and then merge in what, 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 whatever changed. And when he went to find a version control system, all these other ones, um, they, they tracked everything, um, what lines of the file changed, just everything you could think of were, was tracked in the version control software. And when he made Git, every commit is just your project at that point in time. Git doesn't really do anything else. <laughs> it's, got, it's got algorithms in there for a diff, right? When you run a diff, it diffs the two for you, but it doesn't save any information about what lines of code were changed or anything like that. And I like Git because it's the only version control system that I can really find that actually lets you edit history, which I like because at the end of the night, you've, you've had a glass of whiskey and you're writing code, right? At the end of the night, you want to commit your stuff. You go back and you're looking at your commits like, a commit that says, I don't know, like IDK, that doesn't help anybody. So you can, you can change the name of that commit, you can squash it with other ones to give a presentable pull request. <laughs> um, when it says decentralized there, uh, yeah. you mean Git is decentralized. It wasn't your particular implementation of your software, right? Right. So Git is decentralized in the sense that Everybody who works on your software has an exact copy of the software on their system. They don't need to be connected to any server to work on it. They clone the entire piece of software, they work on it, and they can talk amongst each other and push and pull between their own repositories. And that's kind of where... Okay, so when you're down there, you're, you're basically running uh, the software on your laptop to to do your most recent change, and then you'd commit to what? Would you go to the actual GitHub, the, the centralized repository, or were you just locally working with it for the week? So when I was down there, we did, um, we weren't doing any coding. Um, we packaged the software okay. up with all its dependencies and put it on a server and deployed it there. Because um, we wouldn't have had, obviously, access to anything outside on the internet. Um, which I don't have access to right now. So you had a server down there, and yep. then the, the local doctors would have laptops, and they'd com 
connect using this IP address that was a fixed local address, yep. and everything was just local. Yep, it's a it's an intranet that has to be set up, um, and so it's and everybody brings their own device. I'm trying to do you need internet access? Yeah, do you? For this? Yeah, for your presentation. Oh yeah, I just got it. Oh. Okay, <laughs> okay so this is GitHub, and what a bunch of a bunch of guys got together, and they gave it gave you a way to collaborate and to view your code from Git, which is mostly a command line tool. And so this is actually the whole EMR itself right here. Um, and so each person clones this into their own little repository and works on it as they see fit. And when they're done with a feature, or they've got something cool that they want to put into Femur, um, what they do is they do what's called a pull request. <clears throat> and we've got one open right now from one of the students at Wayne State. And you can actually, instead of going on the command line and doing diffs, you can also do it this way, where it'll visually show you everything that the person changed. And you can have a discussion about what they've changed, which is seemingly a lot. And then at the end of the day, everyone decides this is worth putting in or is it? It's not worth putting in. And then you go from there. So it's a small group of people. And so coming up with these discussions where you make agreements on what to put in is kind of a, a, a no-brainer you're basically a lot of times it can be yeah. okay so how you I mean so you if you get bigger better more people involved and all that you have to come up with more formalized ways of you know governing that and yep. as any I suppose open source project you're not to the point yet where you have more than just a handful of people working on this so we've had a total of um, other thing you can see on github is you can see um, how many people have forked your project and worked on it mm -hmm. how many people have contributed to it right so we're at about 18 right now. Um, and to that point, we've recently moved over from GitHub's issue tracking system, which is somewhat primitive, to a, uh, we use Jira now. So what is it? Uh, it's called Jira. It's an issue tracking software. And it lets you communicate a little bit better. Everyone has a profile. And Do you host that on-premise or in, uh, it lets you in? Um, so Atlassian gives you a free, if you're, if you're open source, they'll give you a free license for their software. Gotcha. And that's, okay. A lot of these companies are really supportive of open source. If you show them your repository and that you're active, they'll give you free, um, like IntelliJ IDEA, some of the IDEs, they'll give you free licenses for. It's, it's really cool. Um, 